Okay, so we'll get started. So my name is Lisa Padden. I work in Access and Lifelong Learning in UCD, which is University College Dublin. And I'll be speaking today with my colleague Sue Meehan, who's an educational technologist in the School of Medicine in UCD. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to, as to what we've done in UCD around universal design, the collaborations and partnerships that we've set up, and our current and future projects, which Sue is part of. So then you'll hear from Sue about how she's really worked very hard to embed universal design in her online modules. So in terms of universal design in UCD, it's built into our strategy. So our tagline at the moment is Ireland's global university. So much like other institutions, we're pushing towards international students, which is great. And we have a really diverse cohort of students. So number five in our strategy is that we want to attract and retain an excellent and diverse cohort of students. Part of that, of course, is students with disabilities, but also international students, students from various backgrounds, socioeconomic disadvantage. We have offerings in terms of professional development around universal design, so I'll talk a bit about how we've embedded that. And from that, then, we've developed kind of a culture of champions, which so far is working quite well for us, and I'll show you in one of the projects. So we've collaborated with HR Learning and Development, so we offer workshops on disability support, but also universal design. And any session really that we do, we build universal design into it, because we're always promoting that message. Um, through HR Learning and Development, we tend to uh, get learners from kind of within administration or support staff. So we also collaborate with UCD Teaching Learning, which is fantastic. So there we reach out to faculty who are interested already in professional development, which is great. So it makes them a good audience for us in terms of universal design. We also offer training to individual schools and program offices, and that works very, very well because we can go out into a staff meeting and talk to staff within their own context. They can send us on anything they want to kind of address in particular beforehand, and then we can have a very focused session and staff tend to be a lot more relaxed when they're just with their own colleagues rather than with other people from around the university. They're much more open. And we offer then other seminars. So for example, last summer we ran a seminar on supporting student mental health. And as part of that, really core to that was how you could embed universal design and how that would improve um, student mental health and being proactive in that way. So we've just finished up, or we are finishing up the curriculum review and enhancement process as well in UCD. And again, one of the core questions in that process for all of the, the programmes was, does your current teaching, learning and assessment approaches cater for the needs of the diverse population of learners on your programme? And as part of that, we were able to develop some universal design resources that teams could look at while they were addressing that question in their programme uh, development. We're also embedded in the professional certificate and diploma in university teaching and learning, which is fantastic. And uh, my colleague in UCD, Dr. Terry Barrett, has allowed me to work with her on that. So I would teach sessions on universal design in some of the core modules. And it's actually one of the assessment criteria as well for some of the final projects that the faculty have to say how they've addressed universal design and inclusive teaching in um, what they've chosen to do for their project. So our most exciting project at the moment, and the one that Sue is part of, is we've de we're developing a handbook of good practice in terms of universal design. So the title, the very catchy working title at the moment is A Practical Guide to Implementing Universal Design in Teaching and Learning, Examples from UCD Classrooms. So what we've done is taken, much like Marion has mentioned and we've heard from other people throughout the day, I put out a call, I talked about what universal design was and asked people to look at what they were doing, their own good practice. They might not be calling it universal design, but that it would fit in with that. So we've got 10 really good examples from across the university from di different disciplines. And we have those kind of gathered in three main categories. So major curriculum, innovation and redesign, assessment, and then classroom teaching and learning processes and materials. So we have all of those chapters back, which is great. That was a big achievement. I didn't think anybody would meet their deadline. Um, but we have all of them back and they're full of lots of good things like rubrics, practical examples, tables, figures, um, and they're really providing practical information for other people who want to, might want to implement that particular piece of good practice. So in terms of the case study structure, we asked people, we told people this is not a journal article. We don't want it to be written in formal academic language. We want this to be someone, something that someone can read very quickly and think about it, their own practice and how they can implement this or something like this in their own teaching. So first of all, we asked them to write about why they did it. So was it based on student fe feedback? What issue did you identify that you wanted to improve? Did you reflect on your own teaching and see that it wasn't interactive enough? Or what was it? Why did you actually 
take up this initiative. And then the design and implementation. So very practically, what was it? What did you do? If it was an interactive exercise, give us an example. Let us see what exactly you did in the classroom. And lots of people have included photos, which is great. And then results and findings. So how do you know it worked? So impact is really important. And everybody knows that coming from research intensive institutions. We want to know how you know this has worked. It's not enough just to say, here's something I did and it was really nice and I really enjoyed it. What was the impact for students? How, what did they the, increase their participation? Was their engagement improved? Were their results improved? Was the feedback better? And then advice to others for implementation. So we asked them to be really honest there. So if it took you a long time to implement, tell us that. If you were going to do it again, how would you do it better? So when you're going to run it in your next module, what are you going to do? What are the steps you're going to take? And then a small number of key references. Again, we didn't want it to be like a journal article where there was two pages of references at the end. Really key practical references that people could go away and look at. And they cover lots of different areas. So things like skill support, scaffolding student learning, guidance for students, creative assessments, supports on placement, lots of different um, areas, which is great. And really practical things that I think people will be able to go away and implement. We're, I'm working with AHEAD at the moment. AHEAD have gotten funding from the National Forum for a Digital Badge in Universal Design, which I think is fantastic. And we should take advantage of the fact that the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education have acknowledged Universal Design as something that's really positive, that is professional development for teaching staff. And I mean, that's um, all down to the work that AHEAD has done in terms of promoting universal design, which is fantastic. So in terms of people working in disability offices, you should really take this opportunity to facilitate the badge in your own institution and to link in with your centre for teaching and learning, because that's how you're going to reach out to faculty who will be interested in universal design and to learn about how they can implement it or think about what their good practice is the same way we have done <coughs> and then how that work fits in with universal design. So you're going to hear from Sue who has implemented universal design in her online modules and she has done an absolutely fantastic chapter for our handbook which I'm sure you'll all look forward to reading in June when we publish. Um, but it's just a great example as to things that are going on around institutions and they're going on in every institution, there are academics and faculty doing absolutely fantastic work that nobody else knows about. So I think one of our roles in the disability office is to facilitate those faculty to get that message out there to share their good practice with everybody else. Because th these are things that other people can implement and that we can promote. So who are you going to reach out to? This is the kind of call, for, call to action. So we heard earlier how sometimes people use the excuse of time. It just takes too much time. But this is time very well spent in a disability office because this is a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach. We shouldn't be spending all of our time organizing supports for students uh, who have disabilities we should be going out to faculty and seeing what can be done in the classroom to f facilitate those students and all of the other students who also would need support but can't come and register for those individual supports. So collaborate with your Centre for Teaching and Learning, with individual faculty members who are really interested. We all know they're out there. We hear their names all the time from students coming in to say they've had a really good experience. Students don't just tell us about the bad things. So you can reach out. You can design and implement something where you can promote their practice to others. I'm going to hand over to Sue now for the very exciting part of the presentation. So I'm just going to look at some of the examples of how we um, integrated some of the principles of UDL into our fully online courses. So um, really the why for us was around the specific uh, barriers that come with online and distance learning that are specific to it. Um, for example, the fact that you're working primarily on your own and the learning is self-paced. So even in courses like ours, where there is a release of material every week and it's done within a certain time frame, it's still self-paced when compared to a classroom environment where you have to be there at a certain time at a certain day. So that's, a, that's one of the issues. Feedback then, although we can integrate feedback obviously into online, it's not the same as the kind of informal feedback that you'll get in a classroom environment through a conversation with a peer or just the expression on, on the tutor's face when you ask a question. Um, so, uh, as well as that, just the very nature of online, because it's accessible or flexible, uh, you're going to have possibly a more diverse group of learners than you will in the classroom. Um, and also then the technology itself or the software or the learning management system might not be familiar to the learner. So um, that can also present kind of some extra issues in terms of accessibility and so on. 
So in a way, online and uh, distance learning is a great kind of leveller because those who excel in a classroom environment can actually find it quite difficult to adjust to an online learning environment. And, and the opposite is also true. So a student who might be quite reflective, who could be seen to not contribute a huge amount in a classroom, can actually come to the fore in an online environment. But it, that's why we kind of feel that uh, the principles of UDL, uh, it's particularly apparent in an online environment that it's beneficial to all learners. We'll see kind of some benefits to all learners. So that's what we've tried to do here. So in terms of the courses that we've taken samples from, there are two modules that were developed for the diagnostic imaging department in the School of Medicine. And they're both around interventional radiology. So it's quite challenging content. Um, and our learners, we had quite a small group of learners. Uh, which is what allowed us to kind of, in this iteration of the course, to make some changes. But they would work full time as radiologists in a clinical setting. So they might have some very limited time in their work time to cover some of the content, but the majority of the time they'll be studying in their own time. Um, uh, as far as we know, the majority of them had never studied online before. And we also had some international students as well, for whom uh, English would be a second language. So we try to incorporate all of the three principles that we've seen throughout the day here from, from CAS, from the UDL Centre, of multiple means of representation, action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. The modules did lend themselves more to mul multiple means of representation, which is probably true of a lot of online, but we would hope in future iterations to be able to incorporate more of the other principles as well. We certainly try to touch on those. Um, just in terms of what was already in place, we weren't starting with a blank slate, so this course was already in existence, the content was already there. I think this is the third iteration. And in terms of the tools, um, UCD uses Blackboard. And by default, generally, the authoring tool of choice is uh, Articulate Storyline, which is what you're seeing here. So that was, if we were starting from scratch, we might have made some different decisions, but it was really about using the functionality of the tools that were there and the content that was there to integrate the principles of UDL. So first of all, checkpoint 1.2, to provide alternatives to auditory information. Um, each of our slides would have an audio uh, description or discussion from the academic. Um, and alongside that, there will always be a transcript, which is available in the notes section just at, at the top right over there. Um, but you'll see with a lot of online learning that it's still very text focused. Or there might be audio, and the text might just be bullet points of, of the key points in the audio, um, and so on. But what we've tried to do wherever we can is to enhance the learning with visuals as well. So for example, this slide is about image sampling and how we take small um, elements of, say, an analog photograph to create a digital copy. So the visual doesn't stand alone as an explanation. You do need the audio and the transcript. but we've, we where we can, we try and use maybe a visual cue that will just help to get the penny to drop, basically, and to accommodate that new information, rather than just maybe a bullet point list. Video then as well, particularly uh, this is useful where processes are being discussed. So this is the process of hemostasis. Um, and you can imagine that even with the audio and the transcript, if we use still images, it could still be quite a complex thing to be shown. We all know that with something like a process, it's easier to be shown than just to be told. So that's what we've tried to do here. And that also promotes understanding across languages and kind of meets the need of a use of multiple types of media. In terms then of highlighting critical information, um, that's a difficult thing for novices to be able to do for them to distinguish what's, what's a critical feature and what's less relevant. Um, so we try where possible to use diagrams, to use graphs. Again, there will always be audio and there will always be transcript but this will be timed alongside it so that there's a, a visual representation as well. And another way to do that is to use a process slide. So, for example, here, this, this uh, slide was about digital badges in radiation and how they measure radiation. And it was quite difficult to illustrate with the images that we had available. But rather than just have all of the text on the screen at once and, and have it static, the learners are required to move through the steps of the process, so to actively kind of input and move through the steps, and that just emphasizes each step or each stage of the process. And also under that kind of uh, principle is uh, emphasizing the relationships between information. So when you have to say two subtopics, so here we have employer responsibilities and employee responsibilities, again, rather than just have them as linear slides presented one after the other, the very act of having the student having to click on each of the buttons and that brings up a layer with that information and closes it again, just makes the learning a little bit more active. 
So moving on then to kind of guiding information processing. So again, really important and online. You don't have an external kind of guide to help you through. So you have to make sure that you remove as many distractions as possible, that you give prompts for each step of the process, and that you release information progressively. So we release a lecture each week. And where we can, we'll chunk that into smaller elements as well. So this one lecture is broken into four parts. And we use kind of consistent, simple icons throughout so that students quickly become familiar with the layout. Uh, as I say, we use the, the Blackboard Learning Management System. But each of these four parts of the lecture, they might cover, say, four different procedures or four different types of medication. And they might, use, um, they might have information under similar headings. So we'll try and use a similar structure, similar templates, similar headings if we can. If learner input is required, we'll have a marker that kind of pulses in the corner, it'll fly in at a certain time, and they can click on that to see what's the instruction uh, of what they're meant to do. We also include notes then. So this is for students who might prefer, we still get a lot of feedback that students want something tangible as well as the online. So they can, this is a PDF that they can print off if they like and follow along. There's a visual cue, there's an image of each of the slides in the presentation, and under that, underneath that a space for notes. And this kind of ties in with facilitating uh, management of resources, one of the principles of action and expression. So they'll be able to, it's kind of an external organisational aid, or that they'll be able to access these chunks of information when it's required. And then we also have a resources section. So if a, um, if a policy document, say, or a form is mentioned throughout the lecture, they might see a part of that on the slide, but we also include it so that they can download it and go through it themselves in more detail. So this is, a, first of all, it's an accessibility um, requirement. If we're looking at a policy document, we might just have a screenshot of it, which might not be accessible with a screen reader. So to include it here, someone can, like I said, print it off, download it, um, and use it in their, in their own time. Alongside that, then, the guiding information processing, as well as breaking the lecture into smaller chunks, within each lecture, we'll have a branching slide. So the learner will be able to see everything that's going to be covered. But if we want them to cover the particular sections in a particular order, just the first button will be activated. They can click on that, go through that section of the lecture. And when they've completed that, they'll be brought back to that branching slide. The first button will now be greyed out because they've covered it, and the next button will be activated. But it just helps to structure the learning to give them an overview um, and to kind of guide uh, what's going to be covered. And again, another way to do this, to again, chunk it down into smaller elements. If you, like I say, are covering maybe four processes or procedures or four different subtopics that might have information under um, similar headings, to group those together in a tab slide and again, to get the learner to actively click through those tab slides just emphasizes each of those sections. So as well as presenting them with the content, we want the learner to be able to actually generalize and transfer that information. And people differ in how many scaffolds are required in order to do this. Um, so what we try and do is include techniques that are going to heighten the memorability of the information. So here, for example, you have um, a formative drag and drop. There's no right or wrong answer here. They'll have unlimited attempts until, uh, until they've learned it. So the very act of completing it is actually helping the learner to assimilate the information by dragging the symptoms into the correct envelope. Um, we also want to be able to connect new information and activate prior knowledge. So our students on this course would have learned about the inverse square law as one of the basics of radiology. And this slide then puts that into action or puts it into context. So here we're looking at the fact that if you're using interventional radiology, there'll be a certain amount of radiation uh, that you'll absorb when you're working on a patient. And by dragging the radiologist to different distances from the patient, they'll see how much radiation they're going to absorb. So they'll see that by doubling their distance away from the patient, they'll more than half the amount of radiation that they're going to absorb. So again, it's just activating that prior knowledge and putting it into context. And we try and include explicit opportunities for review as well. So here, the student is clicking on the different tiles, different types of um, radiology exams and they're being told how much uh, radiation will be absorbed and there's also an audio file that goes along with this <clears throat> that provides some further information but this can also then they can turn off the um, volume and they can use this to test the recall and see to have they retained the information so again as many opportunities for review online as possible because we're not getting that same classroom experience 
and being able to enhance then the capacity for monitoring progress. What we do is we try and include as many different types of quiz types as we can because different quiz types will benefit different types of learners. So here we have a gap fill, true and false, a scenario based question where you're told a bit about a patient and you have to decide which action you would take. And again, a kind of matching pair, but deciding which action you would take um, based on the level of uh, a component in the blood. Um, also a kind of multiple choice, but based on, with an image cue. So this is images uh, that they would have seen earlier in the content to check if they can recall that. Again, a formative drag and drop where they get unlimited attempts and then a labeling activity where they would get a, a limited number of attempts. So usually with a quiz question, we'd give them maybe three attempts. They'll be told that they can try again. Ultimately, if it's incorrect, they'll be directed back to the slide where they can review that information or they'll be given the correct answer. But it's just um, you know, making sure that feedback is kind of given in a timely manner, that it's frequently done throughout because you don't have as many pointers as a learner in an online environment as you would uh, in a classroom. Um, in terms then of multiple means of engagement, we also included some online tutorials. It wasn't feasible for us to include a discussion forum just from an administrative point of view. That's what we would like to have done ideally, but we did include some online tutorials using Blackboard Collaborate. Um, the, the learners always have the opportunity to contact their academic throughout the course, but this is a chance for some synchronous feedback and to contact each other as well. So in terms of the feedback that we did get, we didn't, like I say, we had small numbers and we didn't actually focus uh, in this last iteration so much on the delivery or the format, but we did get some feedback from the students and it was positive and it reinforced the inclusion of the principles, particularly chunking the information into smaller elements in the inclusion of the online tutorials um, and the tasks throughout the lecture. We got positive feedback about all of those, but we would like in the future to include more targeted feedback, as somebody mentioned earlier, to see uh, what students think about the format. Some points just to note uh, if you're considering doing this is, first of all, the accessibility of some of the templates. So some of the drag and drop and the hotspot templates won't be accessible to a screen reader or keyboard only. So uh, what I would advise in that is to really consider, does it enhance the learning for some learners, but be sure to include an equivalent alternative that will be accessible. Um, this time round, we didn't have the time, unfortunately, to include alt text and to change the focus. So at the moment, if you were to tab through here with the keyboard, every kind of text box and logo would be, um, would be picked up on and it wouldn't be a, a very positive experience. So that's something that we want to make sure to do the next time round. Um, development time then is the other big thing. It takes a huge investment of time, both from the academics and from the educational technologist. But once the templates are created, it is easy to kind of switch out elements of them and make them usable in other modules. So we have kind of shared all those templates into a, into a shared folder so we can use them across the department. As I say, we'd like to include more tutorials to really kind of try and foster that community of learners. And in future, we'd also carry out targeted feedback. So just as well, you can check if you were to use Storyline they have uh, filled in the criteria for the VPAT section 508, so you can check how they support accessibility, but a lot of it is author controlled, so um, it's really still down to manually making sure that the modules are accessible. And just in terms of the key principles then, so as I said, in UCD we use Blackboard and we use Storyline, but the principles are the same and could be carried across to a number of different formats, whether you're using podcasts or um, uh, a mixture of PDFs and discussion forums and group work and so on. Um, I think the, the things that we feel really worked were the chunking, the making it, making information small little sections that are accessible, um, guiding people through that structured information and making it interactive and the inclusion of feedback throughout. So um, if you have any questions at all.